As Christians, we're told to be self-controlled people. That seems to imply that we need to work harder at trying to fight sin. Well, today on Truth For Life Weekend, Alistair Begg explains that self-control isn't something we achieve through our own strength. We're looking at Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, and today we conclude our study of the fruit of the Spirit. So when we think in terms of self-control, then we realize how desperately we are in need of the work of the Holy Spirit to conform us to the image of Jesus. Let's think about it on three lines. First of all, considering the fact that the need for self-control is clear. Secondly, the nature of self-control we need to understand. The nature of self-control we need to understand. What is it that the Bible is talking about here? It's not talking about external moral influences. External moral influences, like, for example, just say no, can partially condition our behavior, but they cannot eradicate from our sinful hearts the fundamental flaw in our moral makeup. They may educate, but they cannot eradicate. And when you think about that, you realize how important it is that we understand that what Paul is talking about here, again, and don't let's forget, he's talking about fruit. Self-control is the Spirit-enabled ability to avoid excesses and to stay within the God-given boundaries. That's a sort of random definition, that it is, it is Spirit-enabled word-guided, if we might add that too, to avoid excesses and to stay within the God-given boundaries. So that we obey the Bible, we're enabled by the Spirit, and then we cultivate the skill—and yes, I think it is in some measure a skill—of living a thoughtful and a careful life in which we do what is right despite our desires. Because remember, the desires that are within us—you go into chapter 6. And Paul makes it clear. He says, whoever sows to the flesh reaps. Whoever sows to the Spirit reaps. Do not be deceived. He says, God is not mocked. You will reap exactly what you sow. So the Spirit of God at work within us, producing this element in us, enables us to do just that. That's why, again, Solomon, in his wisdom, recognizing that the real issue— is the issue of the core of our lives, says to uh, his, his son, as it were, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Guard your heart. Now, he, doesn't mean, he doesn't mean a cardiological issue. The heart is the center in the Bible of both your mind and your emotions. It, it's just the epicenter, the, the, the eunice of you. So he says, you, you guard that. Because he realizes that every sin is an inside job. So if we manage to do all these different things externally and don't guard our heart, then we will as be susceptible to temptation if we live in a wardrobe as we will if we live in the center of New York City. Because the real enemy of our souls is within. Within. Sinful desires, says Peter, we quoted it earlier— abstain from these things. These are the sinful desires which make war on your soul. Jerry Bridges, who has helped me through these studies, suggests this as a definition, and I'll give it to you. Self-control, he writes, is the exercise of inner strength under the direction of sound judgment that enables us to think say, and do things that are pleasing to God. I think that is actually very helpful. And that instruction is given for all of us in all the different stages of our lives. We don't, we don't have time to do this now, but let me just remind you of it, and you, you can look it up. It is quite striking. When Paul gives direction to Titus to encourage his congregation in Crete— he says, now, I want you to teach what accords with sound doctrine. And then he gives directions for various elements in the church. 
Older men are to be what? Sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled. So he says, I don't want a bunch of old men in your church that are a bunch of dirty old men. I don't want a bunch of old flabby guys that never exercise and just grow fat and miserable. They're supposed to be self-controlled. Now, let me say about your older women. They should be reverent in their behavior. They shouldn't be slanderers or slaves, slaves to much wine. In other words, self-controlled. And they can train the young women to love their husbands and children and to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their husbands. And he's not finished. Likewise, urge the younger men to be what? Self-controlled. So, in other words, there's no stage of life where you, where you get out of this class. It's not like this is a great talk for the teenagers, you know, let's take him in a room, all the boys in one room, all the girls in another room, and give them the talk, you know. No, this runs through the entire operation. Two days before you die, somebody will legitimately say to you, hey, beg, get a hold of yourself. Be self-controlled. Stop doing that. That's ridiculous. Now, the nature of it needs to be understood, and it needs to be understood clearly. And when you go to Titus, you realize that after he's given all of these imperatives, what does he immediately say? For the grace of God has appeared. You see, there's the impetus. There's the dynamic. You never get the imperative in isolation from the indicative. Urge them to be self-controlled. Make sure they stop doing this. Tell them not to do that. Tell them to fix this. Make sure they're self-controlled. For the grace of God has appeared, you see. That's it. That's the issue. That's the wonder of it all. Scripture never expects us to hear God's command separate from our focus on God's work for us in the person of His Son. And when we divorce these things, then we almost inevitably go wrong. Religion says, become by self-effort what you're not. Christianity, Christian faith says, become by grace what you are. Become by grace what you are, because you have been set free, 2 Corinthians 5, in order that you might live for Him. And Paul says we make it our goal to please Him. So someone says— uh, well, why, why, why are you not going to do that? Or why, why, why are you refraining from that? Well, because uh, we've got a lot of rules at our church. No. No, no, no. No, because I've made it my goal to please Him. I, I want to please God. I want to please God so much that I'm not going to do that with you. I'd like to, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to sell out for a simple pleasure, because I have a Father who loves me and who has died for me in His Son, and who has prepared a place for me and who is waiting for me. So, no. My great concern is not what He will do to me. It is what I will do to Him. Search me and try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's anything, Father, in me that makes you sad and lead me in the way of everlasting. Third point. Finally, quickly, number one, the need for self-control is clear. The nature of self-control needs to be understood so that we don't think in terms simply of a self-focused self-effort whereby we are trying on our own to do these things. Grace, 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 enabling grace. How then does self-control become part and parcel of our lives? Because I was using, because I had need and nature I wanted to use the word normal, which is just a problem I have. So I wrote in my notes, how, how does self-control become the new normal? Well, let me just say one or two things, and I'll stop. The beginning of self-mastery, the beginning of our lives being brought under control, is being brought under the control of Christ. The beginning of self-mastery is to be mastered by Christ. It is not asceticism. 
uh, throughout, when Paul is writing these kind of letters, there are all kinds of people around who are saying, you can't do this, and you, you mustn't do that, and if you do that, there's no way that you could ever know or love God, and so on. Paul isn't doing that. In fact, Paul is doing the reverse of that. You can read this in 1 Timothy 4. The Spirit expressly says that in the later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage, require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving, And you need to realize, he says, that everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the Word of God and by prayer. So it's not asceticism. It's not St. Francis of Assisi. It's not, you know, walking around like Gandhi and and, and, uh, putting your fingers in your ears anytime you hear secular music. You can try that if you want, but don't call it biblical self-control. What it means is that in every dimension of our lives is brought under the mastery of Jesus— We'll just say a word or two. First of all, our bodies, right? Romans 12, 1 and 2, present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. What does that mean? Self-control. What is, apply it to yourself. Remember James 1, 14, whatever it was we read? Everyone is, is, is tempted, and they are lured away by their own desire. Self-control. Are you lazy? Are you lazy? Then it's an issue of self-control. Do you, do you refuse to take rest and recreation? You're out of control. Are you and I prepared to eat and eat and eat? It's a self-control deal. Or drink and drink and drink. It's a self-control. Are we prepared to live within the bounds of biblical sexuality? Or are we going to imbibe the spirit of the world? I don't want to labor this at all, because it so easily becomes the focus, and there's so much more to it. But nevertheless, let's just acknowledge this, that in terms of the progression or digression or depression within conservative Christian circles, the impact of a secular worldview in the matters of sexuality, has a far greater hold within the professing Christian church than the Christian church is even prepared to admit itself. And it is a matter of self-control. That's why not only does the Bible say you've got to guard your heart, but Paul says to Timothy, I want you to flee. I want you to make a run for it. Well, that doesn't sound very spiritual, does it? Surely I could stay and have a conversation. You mean like Joseph had a conversation with uh, Potiphar's wife? What a deal that was. You could sleep with me. It won't be a problem. I mean, may the king, the the, goodness, Potiphar, he doesn't have a clue what's going on. This is a perfect opportunity. What does Joseph do? He runs down the street. Why? Because he cares more about God's glory than he does about having sex with Potiphar's wife. Simple. How could I do such a thing and sin against God? In other words, the only way that I could do this is if I enthroned myself and dethroned God. If I decided to worship my own desires rather than to worship the God who has preserved me and and, and prospered me. Contrast David and Bathsheba. He sees, he conjures, he acts— He follows through in terms of our emotions. Self-control. Do you have a spirit of resentment or of bitterness or of self-pity or just a flaming temper? Incidentally, to have a temper that requires being brought under self-control is not a mark of ungodliness. To fail to control it is a mark of ungodliness. So our bodies, our emotions, our thoughts. And with this, we stop. Paul says it is imperative that we take every thought captive, bringing it under the rubric of God's authority. You remember, he says to the Philippians, I want you to think about the kind of things that are good and profitable and so on. When I was young, people would tell me, so you can't listen to that music. 
and you can't listen to those songs. They might have been right. But I mean, my songs weren't that bad. (laughs) She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this really a problem? Are you going to tell me that this is on the same continuum as filthy rap music? I mean, there is a difference. But the principle is there. It's hard to take every thought captive when the stuff we fill our minds with militates against the very lordship of Jesus. We need then to learn to nip these things in the bud. We need to learn to be honest about temptation. We need to say to ourselves, I can't put myself in those vulnerable places. Because the day when, as Sinclair Ferguson has told us, the day when desire and opportunity and temptation combine, that's a tough day. You're really up against it that day. If you've got desire and no opportunity, what are you going to do? If you're tempted but you've got no desire— who cares? Desire, opportunity, and temptation. Watch out for that day, because when they combine, is deadly. So what the Spirit of God does within our hearts is in part to break the chain of self-indulgence, to enable us to resist fleeting pleasures. And we do so in the awareness of the fact that there's a direct flow-through from what goes on between our ears. And when you play golf, people usually say the most, the, the, the most important six inches in golf— are the six inches between your ears. And there's a measure of truth in that, isn't there? Because if you, if you think wrongly, you're probably going to execute wrongly as well. Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. It's clear. And the progress that we make we can't make on our own. That's why God puts us together, so that we can watch out for one another. Let me finish with one illustration. I'm not good on Greek mythology, but I found this, and you will remember it from school, those of you who were better educated than me. You remember the sirens. The sirens were half woman and half birds, remember? And they, they, they lived on a very famous island. And what they used to do was uh, try and beguile the sailors who were passing by, by their entrancing singing. And they would allure them with their singing so that their vessels would run aground on the rocks, they would be shipwrecked, and they would perish. When the hero Odysseus passed by the island, he decided, I can fix this. So he stopped his ears with wax— and he tied himself to the mast of the ship so that he could not be seduced. In the mythology, when the Argonauts traced the same route, Orpheus employed a different strategy. He took a harp and played music of such superior charms that the sailors gave no heed to the siren song. Now, do you get this? It's when our affections are taken up with the wonder of God's grace and goodness to us, when those songs matter so much to us, these songs really have no appeal for us. When Christ is all in all, then we understand how fleeting and how feeble and how futile are these things. We're involved in a continual and irreconcilable war. But it is a war where victory is assured. As we have crucified our lives with Christ in the wonder of His grace to us, as we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And let's not be too um, cautious about saying to one another, hey, you might want to be careful there. Because they see the Spirit of God cultivates within us solid joys and lasting treasures. And all the other stuff is a counterfeit 
It's all vanity fair. It's all candy floss. It all looks so attractive. The entryway to most of these bad clubs is very, very nice. As soon as you go down the stairs, as you often do, you go into virtually a deep darkness. Surely it's a metaphor. And Christ shines his light in our hearts. You're listening to Truth For Life Weekend. We've come to the end of our study of the fruit of the Spirit, but we've reserved a few minutes at the end of the program today to hear a closing prayer from Alistair Begg, so please keep listening. But first, I want to remind you, if you have missed any portion of this series on the fruit of the Spirit, the complete study is available online as a free download at truthforlife.org. Or if you'd prefer to have a hard copy, you can purchase the study on CD, DVD, or USB. The entire series is also accessible at no cost if you have the Truth For Life mobile app. Maybe you've noticed that the app has been recently updated with new features, including the ability to remember where you left off in a study so that you can easily return and continue listening. And the ESV version of the Bible is now available from the bottom menu of the app, so you can read along in the Bible as Alistair teaches. Finally, I have an additional resource I want to bring to your attention. I'm sure you know Easter is coming up next weekend. This time of year, we know many parents and grandparents are working to try to explain the spiritual significance of Easter Sunday to preschool-aged children. There's no shortage of children's books on the topic of Easter, but not all of them are rooted firmly in the truth of Scripture. That's why we're excited to make available a book called The Garden, The Curtain, and The Cross. This is a colorful picture book that does an exceptional job of taking preschool-age children through the story of salvation using words that make it easy for them to understand. The book begins with Adam and Eve enjoying fellowship with God in the garden. It explains how sin entered the world, how God symbolized our broken relationship with him in the temple with the curtain, and then how we're reunited with God through Jesus. If you have children or grandchildren or you teach a Sunday school class, this book is a terrific introduction to the gospel and to the meaning of Easter. Learn how you can request a copy, and while you're online at our website, truthforlife.org, you can view a sample of some of the beautiful illustrations. Now here's Alistair to close today with prayer. Thank you, Father. Thank you that your purpose for your people is to make us what you've designed us to be. And we confess that we have gone through the various elements of the fruit, and we've every so often cringed and been caught up in the, the, the awareness of our own impatience or unfaithfulness. But we want to thank you that it is your blood and your righteousness, Lord Jesus Christ, that allows us to come boldly before your throne of grace, that we stand complete in you, that we're not what we once were, we're not all we're going to be, but we are different by your grace. And so we pray that we might heed your commands and your warnings, that you will pour out your Spirit upon us in fresh measure, that you will help those of us who are toying with sin, fiddling around with temptation, lying to ourselves about why we do what we do and when we're going to stop and why we only want to do it one more time. Lord, help us to flee. Help us to guard our hearts. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine, hoping you'll join us next weekend as we celebrate Easter with a special message exploring the evidence for the resurrection. This program and the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.